Vice President Kamala Harris heads to the U.S.-Mexico border to present her border security plan. On that and other issues shaping the presidential race, we turn tonight to the analysis of Capehart and Pletka. That's Jonathan Capehart, associate editor for The Washington Post, and Danielle Pletka of the American Enterprise Institute. David Brooks is away this evening with a welcome to you both. So Kamala Harris is visiting the border trying to flip the script on what has been a political vulnerability for her. Jonathan, the Harris campaign has tried to gain ground on this issue by pointing to the bipartisan border deal uh, that congressional Republicans blocked earlier this year after Donald Trump came out against it. She's at the border today. What else does she need to do, in your view, uh, to confront this issue head on and try to cut into Donald Trump's perceived advantage? Well, she's, she's doing it. She's going to the border. She's there. Uh, she'll be speaking about it um, later this evening. And, you know, by going to the border and talking about immigration, she, it does give her yet another chance. And she's been talking about this on the campaign trail. Gives her another chance to talk about the bipartisan, um, comprehensive immigration deal that was negotiated by Democrats and Republicans, lead Republicans, Senator Langford of Oklahoma, one of the most conservative Republicans in the Senate, um, had all the votes, and then Donald Trump called up and said, don't vote for it, and it died. Did not even, did not even come up for a vote. vote. It gives the vice president an opportunity to talk about that bill, talk about the things that are in it, and talk about the fact that it had things in there that had her and the president going against their own party because they were looking for a deal to do the exact thing um, Republicans say they, were, um, they wanted to do and the exact thing the American people are saying they wanted addressed. And that is securing the border, but also going further and reforming the immigration system. And uh, Donald Trump didn't want it to happen because he didn't want to give Democrats an issue to run on. And Danielle, part of the Harris campaign strategy here to counter uh, Trump's uh, approach is to use this new ad that they've released today. It's going to air in Arizona and across a number of battleground states. Here it is. Kamala Harris has never backed down from a challenge. She put cartel members and drug traffickers behind bars. And she will secure our border. Here's her plan. Hire thousands more border agents. Enforce the law and step up technology and stop fentanyl smuggling and human trafficking. We need a leader with a real plan to fix the border. And that's Kamala Harris. What do you make of that? I mean, the campaign is pointing to her record as attorney general taking on transnational criminal gangs, but they're not defending the Biden immigration policy, really. Uh, we need a real leader to take on them. That is not a felicitous term that they should have put at the end of that ad because she's been that leader. This was part of her responsibilities. She didn't go to the border. She didn't make it an issue. And I understand. I mean, look, the politics of this are clear. This is an issue where she lags behind Donald Trump, where she's perceived to be less good. And it, you know, she can't just shrug off three and a half years as vice president of the United States and suddenly say, we need new, fresh leadership to deal with that. Where were you for the last three and a half years? You know, but, but I think, look, Jonathan makes an interesting point. Uh, and this is, you know, this is, this is not a, this is a problem for the Biden administration. The Supreme Court has said, and I'm going to read the quote, it says, in, in a decision on immigration, it said that current statute, quote, exudes deference to the president. In other words, the president had and has all the authorities that are needed to do what was necessary to either shut down or regulate the flow at the border and to deport people if necessary. None of that happened for the first three years of the Biden administration. Now, is it good that Congress wanted to address this? Yes. Am I a little bit ambivalent about how it was handled? I am, because I think it needed a solution, and I think sometimes you have to compromise. The argument that many make who opposed it is that the president has these authorities and that the legislation actually limited those authorities. In other words, it would have superseded existing legislation and limited the ability of the president to shut down the border unless there was a certain number of people, an average of four to 5,000 at the border. Now, you know, that was the complaint against it. Is it fair? I prefer compromise and bipartisan solutions, uh, but that's what happened. And it doesn't take away from the fact that Kamala Harris didn't do anything and Joe Biden didn't do anything. 
Well, let's shift our focus to Donald yeah. Trump's meeting with uh, Ukrainian President Volodymyr Zelensky. Zelensky was in Washington yesterday making an in-person plea for more military aid, and there you see him with, with Donald Trump today. Jonathan, what, what were your takeaways based on their interaction? Um, look, I give um, President Zelensky um, major kudos and major props for meeting with Donald Trump. He could very well be the next president of the United States and meeting with a man who has said on multiple occasions that basically President Zelensky should just hand over his country to Vladimir Putin. Um, and so the fact that, pre that the fact that Donald Trump met with Zelensky after saying before that he wasn't going to meet with him because Zelensky said not nice things about him, I guess shows a level of maturity of the former president. But I do think when, when a wartime president comes to the comes to the United States for the purpose of addressing the U.N., um, saying thank you to um, the, the people in, in the, the factory that are making the weapons that he's been able to use to defend his country, um, that is a good thing for him to do. And it's good that Donald Trump met with him. Uh, Danielle, you know, Donald Trump sees foreign policy so much through the prism uh, of money. He talks about NATO countries needing to pay their fair share. Uh, just in terms of the language he used today, he talks about a, a transaction, doing a deal. What would it take to get the MAGA wing of the party and for Donald Trump himself to see Ukraine's success in the best interests of this country? I, it's a great question, um, but I want to talk a little bit about Zelensky for a second, uh, because I think he was uh, manipulated, and I think he was manipulated cynically by the White House. The trip to Pennsylvania that he was going to do, which was one of many trips that he, the ambassador, Ukrainian leadership do to thank the American people and the people in factories. I agree totally with Jonathan. This is a really appropriate thing to do. Had none of the Senate, Democratic senators on the trip, on the original manifest, had a short meeting with Governor Josh Shapiro to sign a sister city agreement, and otherwise was not a political setup, and ended up looking like a campaign visit. Now, that wasn't organized by the Ukrainian embassy. It was organized by the White House. I think Zelensky uh, fell into that. I think he exacerbated that problem when he went and gave an interview to a House organ of the Democratic Party, the New Yorker, and made, uh, frankly, uh, let's say, unwise comments. I happen to agree with some of them, but unwise comments about J.D. Vance. But they created this firestorm. And actually, I give a lot of credit not just to him in reaching out to, to Donald Trump to try to fix this, but Donald Trump being gracious and accepting that, that uh, outreach immediately. So I think that's really important to understand. Because the one thing I haven't seen since this invasion happened is Joe Biden and Kamala Harris stand up and show the necessary bipartisan leadership to sell this to the American people. So what is it going to take? I come back to your original question. It takes leadership. It takes effort. It takes the bully pulpit. People Democrats need to be persuaded. That, Democrats would make the point that, that Joe Biden has shown that leadership and that the reason that there is a Western alliance uh, that has been unified in supporting Ukraine is because of that leadership. Democrats would make that argument, and Ukrainians will tell you, as will the Republicans on Capitol Hill and most Democrats, that the Biden administration has been a day late and a dollar short in every single weapons transfer to the Ukrainians. When they need HIMARS, HIMARS come a year later. When they need aircraft, aircraft come a year later. When they need attackums, they come a year later. When they need to reach into Russia to hit targets where Russians are staging against them and the Biden administration won't let them do it, they finally grudgingly allow them to in the last month. You know, Helping people when they're losing is not the best plan. Helping them when they can win is the right plan. That's what I call leadership, not just going and schmoozing at NATO. What about that, Jonathan? And this is really a bipartisan criticism, that the Biden administration, when it comes to giving Ukraine aid, when it comes to giving them the, the, the missiles that they've asked for, that the Biden administration has been too slow to get to yes. And now the question is, Will the West, will the U.S. give Ukraine the authority to shoot Western weapons deeper into Russia? The administration might get to yes on that question, too, but at the moment it has taken them weeks and weeks and weeks to get there. I'm sorry, I'm just trying to recover from the hurricane of platitudes there. Listen, Jeff, um, 
we can't just be simplistic about this. The hesitation of, of President Biden here in, in Russia's war on Ukraine is thinking that, you know what? We don't want this to flare up into a situation where the United States and the NATO countries are going to have to go to war with Russia. I appreciate and applaud the president's reticence uh, and deliberation in helping the Ukrainians and helping President Zelensky. And, I, and, and I'm glad you brought up the, the major point. The, the president and the Biden-Harris administration haven't been doing nothing. They're the ones who pulled together the coalition that has helped Ukraine uh, last in a war that everyone thought would be over in a week. And the idea that a wartime president like Zelensky could be manipulated by anyone, I think, is unbelievably insulting. All right, Jonathan Capehart and Danielle Pletka. Unfortunately, we are out of time. That's all right. I'm sure we'll, just, we'll, we'll continue this conversation elsewhere. Thank you both. Thank you. Thank you.